we can start because uh, uh, maybe some people will jump in uh, later, but uh, I think the, the our presenters are here and uh, I think we're ready to start. We have a one, one and a half hour program um, and it will be split into basically four sessions. The, the first session is just an introduction that uh, I will just do a quick introduction and we do a little poll. Uh, and then we, uh, we are happy we have two presenters, uh, both from Netherlands um, and uh, I, I bought, bought a bit specialist in different things and uh, super interesting talks. Uh, one is on the, uh, you know, lessons we can learn from the past about biodiversity and extinction. And then uh, Sitze Norte will talk about the uh, uh, relationship between biogeography, geolinguistics and overlap, et cetera. So he'll talk a bit more general about diversity and modeling diversity. So not only biodiversity. Um, so I just want to emphasize that we will uh, we are recording this meeting and uh, we typically release uh, videos, uh, so not on YouTube, we try to avoid YouTube as much as possible. Uh, so we release it through this uh, German uh, TIB uh, portal, uh, German Institute of uh, uh, Information Technology, and, uh, and this video will be available under CC BY license. Um, so just to emphasize that. Uh, we, we will discuss in this webinar several discussion points and some of them a bit controversial uh, and uh, for many things we don't have an answer. That's why we, we want to connect with you and want to see people. Um, so, so there will be some questions on, uh, you know, what is our uh, biodiversity debt? I mean, how bad is it? Um, and whether you believe that some things work or they don't work. And, and so we have this questionnaire and we would like to also find out from you very quickly, uh, what is your opinion and um, do you believe? So there will be some questions about your, like just to check, like what's the state of, uh, what's the confidence you have in some topics? Uh, and then there will be opinion questions. Uh, and then after that, we discuss this fourth session, we will discuss and we will just uh, uh, have an open discussion. We can then zoom in on things and we want to see the results, how you voted. Uh, so uh, usually gets very interesting. We did a lot of, of these uh, science webinars. Uh, so we know that, uh, of course, how to prepare a, a spicy questions and, and you will see it, it will get very interesting to see uh, results. Uh, and sometimes uh, the most interesting in science is the things that surprise you, of course, uh, not the, the ones you can predict. In a nutshell, uh, what we're talking about here is that, you know, we have this our planet and uh, let's say there's a biological evolution and um, uh, that lasted let's say billion plus years and and we came up to human species this uh, evolution came to the human species and so what happened is that if you look to evolution you have many species kind of interact they are in a connected i mean almost all species are connected in the whole planet some are more connected, some are less, but you have also this predator-prey relationship and uh, people discovered in biology that is you have the predator-prey relationship that it kind of leads to some, uh, it's a semi-chaotic, but also can lead to, eventually leads to a very stable pattern. And if you plot it, it's something like this. So it's actually beautifully uh, harmonic pattern uh, where you have the predator-prey uh, being, um, you know, in going in a circle or, or, or some sinusoid function. Um, and then you have the people, people pop up. And uh, what happened is that we started catching all these, uh, uh, the uh, mammals and um, all the animals that uh, we uh, needed to survive. And we started catching and we slowly, we, we were catching all the animals and uh, so-called megabiota. And the size of megabiota that remains becomes smaller and smaller. Basically, we start catching the biggest one, the mammoths and um, the biggest ones. And then we uh, got rid of, uh, caught out all the others. And then we go for the smaller and smaller. And we do it both in the seas and in the land. And so what happens, you don't have any more that curve, the predator prey curve. Uh, the curve goes, goes only one way. It is, it's not more sinusoid anymore. Uh, what happens is there's more and more, more and more of people and we live also longer, uh, even, even though there's differences. Okay, people in Japan live the longest and 
and in some other uh, places uh, they, they live less. But what happened is that, yeah, the things are really degrading um, around us and, um, and we are not in that predator prey uh, paradigm anymore. And as you see, we are growing exponentially and the human population and it's still expected to continue growing exponentially. It will uh, kind of, we are hoping it will slow down to about 11 billion. Uh, but it will still continue growing. But so, so that's the kind of the, you know, the just a, a general introduction to the story, and um, and so now the, the something that pops up with the, when you talk about biodiversity. So one of the th things you know we could ask ourselves as a scientist, uh, trying to be objective, you know, we call this COVID pandemic. It's a global pandemic, but the question is if you. Are, look objectively how uh, maybe we are the pandemic and the COVID-19 is a self-preservation <laughs> mechanism. Um, you know, should we look at the, the problem like that? And, uh, and then the other thing is, you know, we, so we uh, cause the extinction of many species and who's going to pay for that? And, uh, and is, it, is it only the future generations who pay or there has to be some redistribution? So we have to reconsider the uh, this uh, monetary system we have at the moment and the mainstream economy and do we have to reconsider that and question it um so so this is the uh, more or less in a nutshell uh, the idea of this uh, uh, seminar so we are going to touch some controversial uh, questions and we would like to hear your opinion and we were thinking that uh, you know many of you connecting from different parts of the world and some of you are maybe uh, you are maybe into biodiversity. Some of you are not. So we were thinking to do a, a little poll um, and just to get a quick idea of uh, you know how do you feel and where do you stand. Uh, so please, it's a it's a it's a, um, a one choice uh, poll. Uh, so please go. It's just a ten questions uh, to uh, in the first round. Uh, just please go very quickly and don't don't Google please. Just don't Google it. Just uh, hit it, uh, hit like what you feel like, I think this is the answer. Um, because we would just like to, we don't, it's not a test, you know, it's anonymous and we're not going to take it against you or anything. It's just, we would like to see what is the state of your, of your knowledge, you know, just in a general knowledge. So please just go very quickly and uh, do the, do, do the 10 answers. Um, and then we will uh, we will show you the results of these answers uh, after it, uh, we finished uh, with the first talk. Very happy to have with us uh, one more time, Kenneth Reisdijk uh, from the University of Amsterdam, the Biomark Group. Uh, he's an expert for biodiversity and um, uh, also a bit a uh, celebrity person as he was involved in uh, a couple of super interesting projects. And uh, I, was, uh, I witnessed uh, one day uh, uh, one person came to visit me at my home and Ken was also uh, with us. And, and then the lady uh, that was present, uh, she was uh, not in biology or any research. And she looked at uh, him and, uh, and she looked at him and says, I know you somewhere. I know you from TV, I think. And then she says, oh, you are the Dodo guy. I remember you now. So he was uh, some TV show, I think. And, um, and people identify you now with this uh, Dodo project a lot, Ken. So please, Ken, take over. Uh, give us your webinar. Well, um, thank you very much, uh, Tom and uh, Valentina uh, Del Conte for organizing this very interesting uh, symposium on um, biodiversity depths. And I think uh, the questions already show, uh, uh, well, make you realize uh, that major things are going on uh, with our planet and, uh, and the nature. So it's a great pleasure uh, to present uh, uh, my uh, perspective on uh, biodiversity and extinctions uh, and the lessons we can uh, learn from the last uh, 100,000 years. And you see on my starting slide, you see actually the sea level curve for the last 5 million years. And you see that uh, 5 million years ago, sea levels were not fluctuating so much, but they were about 30 meters higher as today. And then about say 3 million years ago, they start uh, to fall and they start to fluctuate and the amplitude of fluctuations increase. And as you can see in the final moment at zero, zero million years ago, uh, the fluctuations are most extreme. 
And uh, we are uh, living at the moment at zero, zero in the very top of this diagram where sea levels are now, from a human perspective, zero meters on average, but they were 130 meters lower only uh, 18,000 years ago. So uh, what can we learn from all this? And on the other, uh, you see also a nice bronze dodo, uh, the extinct dodo. It's a, it's a gigantic pigeon that uh, um, uh, existed on the island of Mauritius. I will talk about this later. So um, I'm from the University of Amsterdam, the Institute for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Dynamics. And I have a background in earth science and uh, ecology. Uh, I'm specialized in island biogeography, and um, I'm acting now as a lecturer for Bachelor of Future Planet Studies and Future Planet Ecosystem Science Master. And my research is really centering on how fast does the landscape change and can nature keep up with this change? And now landscape changes because of geological and ecological processes, mountains form, mountains erode, ecosystems develop, and while they develop, soils are formed. And this all occurs at certain rates. And nature, of course, is used to all these rates of change in the landscape, natural changes. But humans also change a lot. And this is what I'm very interested to compare. How does the rates of change uh, we humans induce in our landscape, how does that uh, compare to the natural uh, rates of change? And can we then relate this to biodiversity and perhaps even to extinctions? And um, to start my presentation, I would like to take you uh, back to 2005, when I was very coincidentally involved in a discovery of a very rich fossil mass grave a bone layer on the island of Mauritius. Uh, Mauritius lies uh, about 500 uh, kilometers east of Madagascar, and it's central in the Indian Ocean. It's a beautiful island. The background of my uh, of the picture of my Zoom uh, picture is actually also from the island. And um, we did an amazing discovery there. We found a very rich uh, natural mass grave. And uh, because it contained also dodo bones, you have to imagine almost two football fields full of dodo bones and other bones from the giant tortoise and other animals, it became world news. And uh, this was the dodo effect because many people know the dodo from Alice in Wonderland and from other uh, popular uh, uh, publications. And uh, so we got a lot of attention for this discovery. But of course the dodo was just a bird like any other bird, a unique bird that lived on Mauritius. So just to share with you some information on, on this uh, still very beautiful island, Mauritius. It's not very big, it's 1850 square kilometers. There live about 1 uh, million people and uh, the island is visited by about 1 million tourists, mainly from Europe and from Australia. And um, uh, yeah, and the tourism dependency is very large of this island. I just uh, found this plot of the Mauritian governmental uh, website, and you can see the tourist uh, amount of tourists are fluctuating in, uh, um, over time. So on the x-axis you see 2080, 2020, and uh, on the uh, y-axis you see 1 million and uh, 1.5 million. And it's fluctuating between this with a kind of rhythm, probably related to when we have holidays in Europe or in Australia. But you see also this enormous plummet. It falls down uh, when the uh, COVID pandemic begins. And this, of course, was a major disaster for, uh, for Mauritius and all the people who live there who depend, their livelihood, quality of life depends very much on, on tourism. And it actually illustrates also the dependence of island states and islands on external income and imports. And this is just one illustration. So I just want to take you back because Mauritius has a, a, a history that is part of the of the Dutch uh, history, the Netherlands. So you see on this map, you see the, uh, the Netherlands and you see this uh, red indented line and it shows uh, the way uh, or ships in the 17th century sailed uh, to uh, the Far East, to Indonesia. And um, 
uh, and it was a, a very long uh, tour, a very dangerous tour with a lot of piracies and all these countries in Europe uh, were uh, had wars with each other. So uh, it was a very risky tour. But in 16 uh, or in 1598, um, the Dutch uh, sailors discovered an island and they called Mauritius. And this island was not habited. It was not habited by humans. It was one of the last islands on the planet that was actually colonized by humans. And in, in this exceptional state, we Dutch uh, people, we were the first uh, people that started to live on this island. And, um, and yeah, in our uh, trade history, we uh, marketed, we sold this island to potential investors to pay for these dangerous trips to buy ships and uh, to invest in, the, in, in these enterprises to sail all the way to Indonesia, for instance, to obtain very uh, precious spices. And uh, in order to uh, make, uh, to reduce the risks, um, uh, the island of Mauritius was a very important uh, station because here the ships could replenish fresh water and uh, fresh food using the natural resources on the island. So um, there was a lot, uh, Mauritius, the discovery was heralded um, at that time in many publications. And, um, and at that time, Mauritius was of course completely forested. So the, the picture you see here is of, is of the uh, Mayburg Bay in the southeast of the country. And you see a lot of uh, patches that are now deforested. They are mainly sugarcane plantations. But this is the bay where the first Dutch ships uh, start settled and where the Dutch uh, colony, uh, the fort was actually raised. And uh, yeah, we replenished here water and uh, catched, uh, caught um, the giant tortoises and other animals that were alive there. And uh, they uh, formed a very important food source uh, on our way back home or all the way to uh, Indonesia. And uh, in 2005, I came, I was invited by a friend to visit this island. And um, the question was, um, can, it, can you and your colleague reconstruct how uh, the situation looked like when this, uh, the Dutch settled there in uh, 1640? What, how did the landscapes look like? And what kind of vegetation was there growing? So I went uh, across the island and did uh, uh, a field research with a colleague of mine, an uh, expert in, in fossil pollen. And we collected samples from various marshes on the island of Mauritius. And one site, we actually, by sheer coincidence, we found uh, it was very rich in fossil bone material. And we uh, started to dig there. We were, uh, we asked whether we could use a digging machine and the landowners allowed us to use a digging machine. And then uh, we, we collected this sample uh, after some digging. And this is a, a scoop, which is about one meter wide and it's completely filled with bones. bones. And uh, if you zoom in, uh, you see tortoise shells lying and uh, if you zoom, zoom in, you see here a foot bone of the dodo. And the dodo is this iconic uh, uh, species of extinction, which features in, uh, in this book, Alice uh, in Wonderland, uh, that was published in the 19th century and was a bestseller by then. And that is why this particular bird has become so famous. And um, so, as I told you already, we got a lot of attention by the media and that allowed us to collect money to pay for several uh, expeditions to Mauritius, and we investigated the site uh, over several years. Uh, seven years we went there uh, to collect samples and uh, to dig, and then uh, we spent uh, more years to uh, analyze the data and to try to find out how this musgrave was formed. Why did all these uh, animals die there on this spot? And you have to imagine it's two football fields full of fossils. And we did this uh, research in collaboration, of course, with the Mauritian partners, the University of Mauritius, the Mauritius Wildlife Fund, and the Mauritius uh, Natural Her Heritage Fund. 
And we discovered all kinds of animals that are present are extinct. About half of the animals we discovered, like the giant parrot, the Lophocyticus, or indeed the dodo. Huh? You see here this uh, bronze uh, artist maker, uh, Nick Bibby, who is actually uh, making a mold for a beautiful bronze uh, dodo, but also a giant tortoise with a very long neck and some other animals that are extinct now. So of all the animals we found, half of them were extinct. And to me, that was an eye opener. I, I was really surprised. And then of course, extinction is part of life. So we know, we all know that uh, 67 million years ago, uh, the planet was hit by a meteorite and that was the end of uh, uh, the dinosaurs and uh, uh, many other species as well came to an end as a result of this impact and the enormous uh, change uh, of our biosphere that uh, completely uh, uh, changed as a result of this enormous impact and uh, uh, led to a nuclear winter, which lasted for at least an, uh, a year. And uh, so many animals uh, uh, became extinct. And this, of course, happened much more in the history of the planet. And uh, um, uh, we, we call this extinction, the end of the dinosaurs, we denote it as the fifth extinction, like Tom already pointed out. And there were before the fifth, there were other extinctions earlier in time. And the big ones we call, uh, the, we give them numbers and the smaller ones are uh, just uh, also occurring, but they are not um, mentioned as being the fourth or the, the third or the second extinctions, but locally extinctions are part of life. So it was not so surprising that when you find a fossil a muskrat that you find uh, extinct animals. Actually, I would be surprised if they weren't extinct. But what was surprising is that most of the species we found just had become extinct uh, since uh, the Dutch uh, started to live on the island, since 1650. So that is very recent. And you have to imagine that all these animals lived on this island for millions of years. So to me, this was a, a, a mystery. How did this happen? So uh, in order to understand uh, that uh, extinctions occur disproportionately more on islands, you have to understand that islands actually, um, uh, that evolution on islands um, causes uh, specific species to form. So for instance, the dodo is unique to Mauritius. Hey, there may be thousands and thousands of islands, but only one island had the dodo. So if we uh, uh, do something on the dodo on Mauritius, if it becomes extinct on Mauritius, it's extinct globally. So that's why uh, extinctions we humans are aware of, uh, most of the extinctions are known from islands whereas uh, extinctions in inlands are harder to detect. And um, together with Sietze, who will uh, present after me, after this presentation, we uh, then looked into the history of Mauritius, trying to understand uh, whether uh, the land use change played a role in uh, causing also extinctions. And um, as you can see in this graph here, you can see that over time, the island of Mauritius uh, became deforested. Okay, you see native vegetation cover on the I-axis, and you see that it is declining. The green line is uh, dipping downwards towards almost zero in uh, 2000. Whereas on the other hand, you see the increase of humans, and you see that humans increase over time, not uh, uh, like an exponentially uh, 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 um, regular process, but rather irregular, depending on, on local historic events. Um, but even though when humans were not uh, increasing in numbers, uh, the deforestation continued. So with the loss of forest, you can imagine that the probability of going extinct increases. And uh, you can, of course, imagine the forest is the house of many animals. And when we uh, deforest, uh, when we remove the forest, there is no house for animals anymore. So they start to become extinct or they become more vulnerable for other pressures, like, for instance, the introduction of uh, predators. So oceanic islands generally don't have predators uh, uh, on these islands. 
Um, but when humans come there, uh, um, either by coincidence, they bring uh, animals on their ships. They are not aware of, the humans are not aware of that they bring rats, for instance, on their ships, and that these rats escape on an island like Mauritius. And then as there are on the island like Mauritius, no predators, the rats can grow in populations and they can swarm the whole island and they can, for instance, eat the eggs of the dodo. And we think this happened. And besides rats, cats were introduced, pigs were introduced, goats were introduced, deer were introduced, all kinds of animals were introduced. And as there were no predators that would hunt these animals down and kept the population of these animals in check, um, these animals uh, uh, threatened the local animals and the local animals became uh, uh, progressively extinct. So this is what we had found uh, fossil evidence of, of uh, local extinctions. So when you calculate the mean deforestation rate uh, on uh, the island of Mauritius, it was about five, kilo five square kilometers per year. So that's, uh, but is that fast? Can nature keep up with these deforestation rates? Does it lead to extinctions? We actually don't know exactly because we don't know exactly how fast uh, landscapes change over time. But what we do suspect is that the rates of human induced changes uh, exceed ecological recovery times. So when we deforest an area, uh, the nutrient rich soil on which the whole ecosystem thrives becomes lost. It erodes away only within weeks after uh, deforestation, these soils uh, uh, are being eroded away. And soils take about thousand years to form a meter of soil. So uh, uh, humans can uh, remove them uh, within, uh, uh, um, within a century or even faster. And to recover these soils, it takes in, on average on the planet, it takes about thousand years to recover one meter of fertile soil. And it takes after you have formed a soil on an island, which also takes uh, 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 centuries after you've formed the soil, it takes again centuries to form an ecosystem. So you can imagine that on an island like Mauritius, a rich ecosystem evolved over thousands and thousands of years. And here you see actually a, a, a trophic network, which is actually the, in, the web of interactions that exist between all these species. And these interactions define the resilience of an ecosystem. The more interactions you have, the more resistant that ecosystem becomes against perturbations. So if you have a rich ecosystem, it's perfect adapted to, uh, to, to um, uh, deal with uh, extreme changes, uh, for instance, by extreme climate changes or by extreme effects of uh, land changes. But um, now we have some idea about uh, artificial uh, rates of land change. Um, we are also very curious, what are the most extreme rates of land change, uh, removal of forest in nature? Uh, and um, uh, how, uh, and did those changes, those natural changes caused also extinctions? So uh, nature can regenerate, but can nature keep up with the human induced landscape changes? And one of the fastest and large scale natural changes we know of is sea level rise changes. So when the sea level was very low during the ice age and it started to rise under 30 meters uh, in total, you can imagine that a lot of uh, tropical forest in the coast became flooded and was lost. And you can imagine that uh, many islands became smaller. Did that change extinctions? And we know that the fastest uh, rates of uh, sea level rise were about 40 meters in thousand years. So, uh, um, um, so these are extreme high rates when the, at the end of the ice sheets, the ice uh, sheets melted and then uh, uh, sea level started to rise on uh, very high paces. So let's have a look at how uh, sea levels changed over time. And again, we can see how uh, at, the, at the last few million years of our history, 
of the history of the planet, sea levels oscillated ex, uh, towards an extreme degree, and we are within the red circle. So we are very coincidentally at the very top of this uh, sea level uh, high position. Uh, and you can immediately see that the average sea level is uh, uh, just around, uh, say, for the last million years, is at around uh, minus, 100, uh, minus 50, uh, 65 meters lower below present. And as the sea level rise, landscapes become, islands become smaller, and some islands uh, uh, fragment and land bridges are formed. So um, how did the local species that lived on these islands, how did they deal with these uh, changes? So in order to investigate this, together also we started this process. We made uh, a, a sea level rise models. And uh, we started uh, this process with Tom Hengel uh, years ago. And, uh, and then with Sietze and with other colleagues, we finally came to a, a model that is able to, to, um, to identify the rates of sea level change at the end of the last ice age. And this is a, uh, yeah, a, a complex geophysical model whereby we use uh, uh, various geophysical parameters to uh, make an accurate uh, prediction about uh, the heights of sea levels uh, at certain time uh, steps. And here you see, uh, uh, for instance, uh, for Greece, you see how uh, the area changed over the last uh, 18,000 years. When the sea levels were low, you see that the land was much more extensive. And when the sea level started to rise, all the land shrunk and some islands disappeared and some islands fragmented. And from our work in, uh, in for instance, in Greece, we noted that, uh, yes, extinctions must have been probable on these islands, but as a result of sea level rise and land loss. But these were local extinctions. So these were extinctions that on, one, uh, on a few islands, uh, a certain species was lost. But uh, uh, on other islands, the species survived. So this uh, uh, teaches us that actually uh, the effect of sea level rise and, and natural extinctions, uh, global extinctions, is uh, we, we didn't find evidence for that so far. And uh, if we look at what happened at certain islands, for instance, at Mauritius, we see that uh, uh, when the sea levels rose uh, 120 meters, we see that the island contracted 10%. Uh, but the dodo, uh, it didn't affect the dodo. And we also have another island nearby Mauritius that even contracted 90%, but it didn't affect any of the living species on that island. So uh, even, uh, but also we can see in the red letters below uh, the slide, you can see that Rodrig the land loss on Rodriguez, the small island uh, east of Mauritius, uh, was lower still than the deforestation rate on Mauritius we had identified from our earlier studies. So uh, uh, we could probably conclude that, um, especially at the end of the, uh, of the few million years of sea level change, animals, including the dodo, got used to sea level change. So uh, when, as you can see, this is happening so often uh, during the past million years that uh, the, the biota probably adapted and dealt with it. And the rates of change were probably not so high that it caused extinctions. So in what we found on Mauritius, we found on other islands as well, eh, especially Sietz's uh, latest uh, research, also shows how in spite of very different histories uh, after human habit, hab habit, habit uh, colonization, um, deforestation occurred, and um, uh, we can infer that as a result of fast deforestation, um, uh, similar extinctions may have happened on these islands all over the world. So from our model, we can now, uh, for instance, calculate how much uh, land was lost um, in, the, in the tropical zone. And we uh, deduced that in, uh, over the period of sea level rise, uh, about 1 billion hectares uh, were lost in the tropical zone over 18,000 years. But 
over 40 years, the last 40 years, we deforested uh, the same area. It's hard to believe. I find it, if I say this, I, I would like to ask you, please check, perhaps I make a major mistake here because it's so hard to believe that we, that we change so fast in so, such a short time, uh, the face of the planet. And this is all the effect of the, uh, of the fact that we are now living in what we call the Anthropocene or the great acceleration. The, the time that we as humans, as Tom just showed, hey, we, we started to grow exponentially, but that's not really the problem. They're not too much humans, but we want too much. So as a result of what we want at the moment, what we want from our planet, we exploit our planet, we deforest our planet, and, uh, and this is all, uh, if, you, if you look into it, this is all driven by an economy that is based on monetary growth. The more money grows, the more money there's available to, to, for mining and for uh, many other activities. And many people think the earth can handle uh, what we humans do, but um, the earth might be huge, but our biosphere is in fact uh, very thin. It's, it, it's a, a very thin film of only 40 kilometers thick and we can definitely change it. So uh, we should be really uh, very uh, careful with our biosphere. And we should really monitor what we are doing at the moment with our biosphere because uh, now animals are becoming extinct, but these extinctions are in fact a symptom of a biosphere that is becoming degraded. And it's not bad for the planet, but it is bad for, our, for us as humans because it's the sphere where we live in. So to conclude, uh, in 2020, we produced already much more uh, mass of built materials than the, uh, the mass, the total weight of the biosphere of anything that lives on the planet. And this only happened in the last hundred years. We built already as much as the total biomass weight. So if we continue doing this, there won't be any um, yeah, biosphere for us to live anymore in uh, a, a good life. And this is not happening uh, in 100 years. This is happening now. So uh, we really should monitor uh, what we are doing and we should uh, uh, sustain, uh, deal with our natural resources in, a, the in the most sustainable way as possible. And in this paper, we argue that we also should monitor the effects of mining. So in the end, I would, advocate that we need an economy based on conserving our life sphere, on biosphere, and that we all should cherish what we have. It's the place where we live in and where we can together increase the quality of all livelihoods. Let's do this. Thank you for your attention. And um, I'm happy to receive any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. And um, uh, as you see, the Ken already had answered on some of the questions we yeah. uh, we gave you. So if you if you followed the carefully, uh, you will uh, you you could find I think about uh, 50 60 percent of answers. Oh, wow. uh, and also Ken, you know, he picked up this example with the mining. Yeah. And he picked up Croatia on purpose because I'm I'm original from Croatia. <laughs> he wants to yes. put the blame on me. Yes. And in the same way, I will. Uh, you know, we we have this virus debt. And yeah. so I think we should give the bill also to biodiversity experts at the end of the on the end of the webinar. But uh, thank you so much, Ken. And uh, Vale, are there any questions that people, if you want to ask something, Ken, or if you have a comment, uh, just put it in the chat, um, and then we will uh, we will uh, um, uh, forward to Ken. So people that guessed the Croatia in the poll also, they are, they should be happy. Blame Croatia for everything, yeah. Yeah, well, it's. I think it's easy to blame. You know, we are all humans and we are all fulfill uh, a little task on this planet. Uh, so we make our own uh, quality of the biosphere. And I, I believe that if we uh, change our mindsets, uh, not even radically, but if, if a billion people change mindsets in a, in a, in a focus on, on um, sustainable uh, actions, then together we can do it and we can, uh, uh, we can uh, whatever we do, whatever jobs we, we have, we can actually uh, 
improve or uh, the way we deal and we handle uh, our planet. So uh, much of what we know now is just very recent knowledge. It's only, uh, uh, hey, Tom, it's your core business to monitor what's happening on the planet. And all the techniques you evolved, they, can, they, they couldn't uh, be evolved 10 or 20 years ago, right? It, it, so there's a, here's a question like, um, yeah. you know, Mauritius, you said they were Dutch uh, uh, sailors and people started uh, populating the island. Yes. And, and so somebody would think, you know, that like with some species, I mean, we just ate all the species, basically. We just hunt yeah. them down and ate them. But in yeah. Mauritius, and actually that's the tragedy is that most of the species that we made extinct, extinct that we didn't make them directly extinct, but we, we un unconsciously, you know, we, yeah. we're not, you know, like uh, in uh, Christianity say, God, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. Yeah. Right, uh, so we we did it completely unconsciously, and um, and so that's yeah. probably ninety nine percent of species that we made extinct. It's really unconsciously and absolutely uh, just because yeah. we are unaware and and uh, basically uh, yeah. we 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 didn't know what we're doing, right? Yeah, and I can add to that. So to give you an example, most people think that the dodo uh, has been eaten to extinction, but it hasn't. We uh, the the people who went to Mauritius, the Dutch. They didn't eat the dodo to extinction. They couldn't. They were, the island was too big, big and there were too few people. But what we did do as humans, we brought in animals that started to put pressure on, uh, on the local ecosystem that started to put pressure on the dodo. So um, it's not so much hunting that uh, does it, but it's a multitude of factors, deforestation, hunting, diseases we bring and animals we bring from other places to other, uh, to, to islands like this. And all together they work and cause extinctions. Okay, I have a question. So we have a question now, it's uh, related. It's the same context. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so now we, let's say now we know, we know now, now we're a bit smarter than yeah. 50 years ago, 100 Absolutely. years ago. And so what do we ago. do now? Which are the good examples? Which are the islands where yep. you, you will say like, uh, this is really good system. Uh, this yep. island should be really proud of. Uh, well, which are the good examples? Let me start also with Mauritius. Mauritius uh, is one of the global leaders in uh, um, restoring uh, ecosystems. So they have set aside two islands at least that are uh, nature reserves. One island, fish, uh, tourists are allowed to come to see how the nature looked like that is completely restored. And the other island is uh, um, uh, like an ark. Uh, nobody is allowed to come there, only scientists and uh, nature conservation people to make sure that the process of nature restoration is not being interfered. So, um, uh, you know, we, we uh, so th that's a beautiful example of uh, opening up uh, some areas and uh, allowing some areas to, um, uh, restore to uh, their original conditions. So Mauritius is a, is a, a leading example there. Um, just to say also something very positive and highlight something positive about Mauritius. But I think uh, my research is now also etching uh, on economy because I start to realize uh, the last uh, say year, I start to realize that um, the way we have organized uh, economy, which is a global north invention, the, 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 the way we, uh, we trade and uh, put uh, money in front of everything is also a very big accelerator of um, uh, yeah, the exploitation of our planet. Uh, it's a system in positive feedback. So uh, one thing uh, we should do all together is to uh, take a different perspective on an economy and uh, design an economy that is actually in harmony with, uh, with the fragile biosphere. And when I say fragile biosphere, I just mean the layer that is nice for humans to live in because if the biosphere changes and other animals will uh, benefit from it or plants or whatever. <laughs> Okay, and with this, we have to stop now. I'm very yep. sorry. Uh, we have to stop. We go to the next presenter so you can stop sharing the screen. Yep. And, uh, and as I said, we have the, the second talk. It was by Sitsa Norder. Uh, and um, I know Sitsa personally. I was actually uh, his co supervisor during his uh, master degree uh, at the uh, University of Amsterdam. And uh, he did a PhD on island biodiversity. Um, in defending 2020, and he got uh, cum laude for his PhD, and uh, now he's a postdoc at the uh, at the University of Leiden, 
uh, it's super interesting topic. He uh, looks at really uh, super multidisciplinary research as the illustration shows on his first slide. It's a cross, it's a cross between um, um, a bit of anthropology and uh, biology and um, geography. Um, and with this, I would like to pass it on to uh, Sice. Please, Sice, uh, keep it 25 minutes and keep some uh, time for questions. The floor is yours. Hello, everybody. Very nice uh, to see you. Thanks for uh, putting your camera on. Then uh, I don't have the idea that I'm talking to uh, to a screen only. So uh, and thanks also uh, to the Open Geo Hub for uh, inviting me. So I will talk today about the global hotspots of biological and cultural diversity and explore some of the parallels between biogeography and geolinguistics. Well, at first hand, you might think, wow, this is a really uh, weird combination. So let me briefly uh, say something about my own uh, background. So, um, yeah, so I, I did my uh, PhD in, uh, in uh, Lisbon at the University of Lisbon. Uh, about island biogeography in the Anthropocene and Quaternary. So the basic idea is how do rates of change of, of induced by human activities relate to long-term natural dynamics uh, on islands? So, uh, so it was really uh, grounded in, in uh, biogeography. And uh, since about uh, well, one and a half years, I'm at the University of Leiden. I'm doing my postdoc there, and I'm trying to understand the environmental and societal drivers of uh, cultural and linguistic diversity. So basically what I'm doing is applying uh, the methods uh, uh, and theories from biogeography to understanding the distribution of, uh, of, of uh, cultural diversity uh, globally. So and for example, I, I've developed a, a R package called Glutter Space to facilitate the analysis of, uh, of linguistic and cultural data. This really work in progress. I thought, well, this open to you up there will be probably some some nerdy people, so please, if you're enthusiastic, uh, welcome to join in there. Um, so yeah, we live on an incredibly diverse planet. We, the planet Earth houses a fascinating diversity, both in terms of uh, living plant and animal species, as well as in terms of cultures. And as far as we know, it's the most diverse planet in our solar system. Wow, what a surprise, eh? But if we zoom in to our planet, we also see that this diversity is very unequally distributed across the globe. This is true for both uh, biodiversity as well as cultural diversity. However, we also see some general patterns, and one of them is the latitudinal diversity gradient, uh, which, uh, which, uh, which shows that, that the diversity, both in terms of, of plant and animal species, as well as in terms of cultures, is generally higher, closer to the equator. And actually, we see that um, if we look at the association between biodiversity, for example, in terms of mammals and birds, this is strongly associated with linguistic diversity. So during my talk, I will continuously zoom in and out between the global scale and the local scale. And when I talk about the local scale, I'm mainly focusing on islands because this is where my experience uh, is. Uh, and also because they are really relevant in terms of biocultural diversity. Um, so yeah, so what about these islands? Can I briefly touch upon this? So islands, 7% um, of Earth's land area, but 20% of global biodiversity and uh, over a quarter of, of the world's languages. So, but then if you look at, at this uh, image, you might be a bit confused. So there on, on the left uh, for you, on the top map, you see uh, the island floras and you see mainly blue, uh, circles, light blue, dark blue. And then at the bottom, you see uh, the mainland flora. So the, the number of plants on the mainland and you see mainly the reddish and orange colors. So basically what you see is that species richness, in this case for plants, is uh, generally much higher on the continents than it is for, on islands. However, uh, what this doesn't show is the, the relative contribution of these species that are on these islands, because those species on these islands are generally island endemic. So they, they are restricted to a, to a particular island or archipelago. So those species that we find there, we will find nowhere else on, on the planet. So islands uh, contribute disproportionately to global biodiversity. Um, yeah, so, and also the number of species per, per uh, unit area is much higher on, on, uh, on islands. And this is the same is true for uh, languages, as you can see in the, in the bottom right, these, uh, 
um, bars. So a very brief intermezzo about island biogeography. I could talk about this for, for days, but this is just in one minute. So if you want to, to summarize it, uh, yeah, there was this 1963 paper by MacArthur and Wilson in this book uh, in 1967. So uh, the basic idea is if you have a larger island, it can house a larger number of species compared to a smaller island, uh, keeping all other conditions the same. And also islands that are closer to the continent can house more species than islands that are located further away. So, but of course, um, as Kenneth already showed, island area changes and the same is true for the continent. So only 20,000 years ago during the last glacial maximum, we could walk from Ireland to the Netherlands, from, from New Guinea, all the way down to, Australia, to, to uh, Tasmania. So the world looked really different. And actually we see strong legacies of these, of these past, uh, past conditions, for example, uh, if we look at endemic uh, island species for, in this case, snails and, and flowering plants, we see that the number of, of, of single island endemic species is much larger than we would expect based on current area alone. So, um, so and, and if, we, if we consider the past area of these, of these uh, islands, then we are better in explaining the richness on, uh, on these islands. And then, uh, uh, if we look at cultural diversity, we also see, just like with biodiversity, that that, that island area, so environmental uh, settings of, of environmental uh, characteristics of an island, and in this case area, really explains patterns of cultural diversity. So larger islands also house a larger number of languages. So uh, the bottom line is, if we talk about biodiversity or cultural diversity, environmental conditions matter. A lot. But now, Kenneth already talked about it. We have entered the Anthropocene. Um, we, we know these hockey stick curves. So human activities are drastically influencing uh, biodiversity patterns and also cultural diversity patterns. So if we want to compare what is happening now, how does this relate to these long-term natural dynamics? And for example, here again, Mauritius, Kenneth already showed, okay, in, in the light gray areas, you see the area reduction in say 20,000 years from light gray to, to the darker gray shades. But then in only 400 years of human settlement, nearly the uh, entire island has been deforested. So really the rates of change have drastically increased. So here's one study I was involved in. We compared uh, 30 islands, nearly 30 islands around the globe and we found a consistent pattern that the rates of turnover, of, of vegetation turnover, so the rates at which vegetation across all these islands change following human arrival, accelerates with a median factor of 11. So this is really drastic. And this, this correlated really well with, with the, the moment of human arrival and could not be uh, explained by these natural conditions. So it's really, uh, it's not only, um, the magnitude of change, but also really the rate of, of, of change. Uh, yeah. So then island extinctions. So islands, um, depending on, on, uh, on the source, between 60 and 75% of all species that went extinct worldwide were island species. And that's really remarkable if you think they cover only 7% of Earth's land surface. And from, for some taxa like birds, it's even more drastic. So 95% of all birds worldwide that went extinct were island birds. So, and also those species that are now most endangered, 50% of them are island species. So it would be good to focus our attention uh, on islands. So that's why we wrote uh, a scientist warning paper. You might've heard about these kinds of uh, papers. So to really, put this uh, under attention of the wider public. So, and then for example, if you look at the global top 10, top 15 of the proportion of threatened or extinct species, nearly all of them are uh, island nations. So for mammals, there's only one mainland nation and for birds, all the top 15 were our island nations. So what are the drivers for this tremendous loss of global biodiversity? Well, basically there are three main threats for terrestrial biodiversity. 
And as you see for marine uh, diversity, it's, it's, it's the, the, the proportions are a bit different where exploitation is, is uh, much more important. For terrestrial species across taxa, habitat degradation is by far the, the most um, important driver for habitat loss, followed by, by uh, over-exploitation and also introduction of invasive species and disease. So uh, remember habitat degradation, I will talk about more about that in, in, in a later slides, but then before we go there, we move again to cultural diversity because not only biodiversity is highly threatened, but cultural diversity is severely threatened as well, even more so than birds and mammals. So, um, and again, many of, of, of those languages that have disappeared or are disappearing were island languages. 25% of critically endangered language, languages and even 50% of, uh, of, of those that are uh, endangered and 12% of language extinctions were island languages. So for example, uh, just to give one example, this is an image of Boasr. She was the last uh, speaker of Bo, which was an uh, indigenous language from the Andaman Islands. So when she, um, when she passed away in 2010, her language disappeared as well. And this is just one example. There are many of examples like this. So when we think about species loss uh, and, and loss, of loss of cultures and languages, these are really much more related than we might think. I will talk about, about that a bit more in later slides. So I talked about the main drivers of uh, biodiversity loss worldwide. So what are the main drivers of, of language loss and endangerment? So what we see, for example, as you might expect, so the, the orange bars, the larger the, pop the, the population of speakers, the less uh, threatened a language. So the more vital a language is, as you expect. However, if we look at uh, the main drivers of loss, these are uh, things like road density. So how, how, how well connected uh, are, um, are, the, are these uh, cultures uh, to, to road networks? That's really a main driver of, of language loss and even also uh, 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 yeah, education and uh, years uh, spent in school. So people will shift to uh, like uh, majority languages eh? as we see also where I uh, um, where I grew up in the Netherlands, more and more there's a shift towards English. And of course, the, you have this also with it in the subnational level as well, that schooling is in the in, in the national language. So these are these are two of the main uh, drivers of language endangerment. So Kenneth briefly talked about the six mass extinctions. So what about it? So well, there's good news and there's bad news. Let's start with the bad news. So the rate at we at which we are currently losing species is much and much larger than background rate. So the, the number of species that we are, are losing now is much larger compared to, to the number of species that we lost over the past uh, millions of years. So the, the, I mean, the rates have drastically increased, the rates. However, if we look at the magnitude of extinctions, um, we are not at this 75% of species threshold. That's uh, often used as a threshold to talk about the mass extinction. So uh, to remind you, the fifth mass extinction was when the dinosaurs were wiped out uh, by this asteroid. So we are not there yet. So why is that good news? Well, that means that there is room if we now drastically slow down rates of extinction, we, we can avoid this six mass extinction from happening. However, if we do not act now, within a few centuries, we will be at that point again. And then we leave our planet much more impoverished than what it was and how we uh, found it. And actually, if we look at languages, we see a similar thing. So if we don't intervene now, language loss could triple within 40 years and with at least one language per month, which will total to 1500 languages by the end of the century, which is 20% of global linguistic diversity. So uh, we have to tackle these together. So how can we how can we halt these rates of extinctions? So I think there are both practical uh, practical things that we can do, practical interventions at the at the local scale and at the, at the global scale and also more uh, cultural paradigm shifts, but also at both scales. So first again, island biogeography. I showed already that Large islands house more species, can house more species than smaller islands. And um, 
it hasn't gone unnoticed that this theory of island biogeography sometimes also applies to uh, conservation. So again, if we have uh, larger conservation areas, they can also house a large number of species. So if we look at the global scale, only 15% of the global terrestrial surface uh, is, is protected. So if we want to conserve uh, species, if we want to help biodiversity loss, we have to increase this area. And of course, that's not the only thing. We also need to reconsider how we design our cities, how we shape our agriculture, how we, how we consume. So these, of course, are all related. We cannot only just set apart areas for conservation. We also have to reinvent uh, how we use the land. And uh, to, to give some examples of conservation success stories, at the local scale, for example, here, this was a study about uh, of around uh, 30, um, 30 uh, uh, species that were on the brink of extinctions, and they, and they um, assessed the probability that extinction has been prevented by conservation actions. It was a nice paper in, in, in 2020. And also here, 65% of those species that they considered were island species. So really, we, if we want, if we put our efforts if we are dedicated and also invest in that, both in time and in monetary resources, we can halt species extinction. To give another concrete example of, uh, of the ebony trees on Mauritius, they were basically a zombie forest. They, this forest, this was not reproducing. So all the seeds that fell off the mother tree fell just there at the stem. So this, this uh, forest was a living dead. And why was that? It was because the, the main frugivores, the largest frugivores, they had already disappeared, which was the, was, was the um, giant uh, tortoise that was, was endemic to Mauritius. So when these, these uh, giant tortoises disappeared, also uh, this forest could not re re regenerate, rejuvenate. So then what uh, people did in a really bold action was reintroducing giant tortoises from other islands to Mauritius to revive this forest. So it's not only conserving what's there, but it's also um, uh, restoring lost interactions. So it's not only about one species or conserving habitat, but also restoring uh, interactions. And then I promise to talk about shifting paradigms. So here, I think this uh, um, figure is shocking if you think about it, 50% of the global habitable land is used for agriculture. And 80% of that, 80% of all agricultural land we are using to grow feed for livestock or for livestock grazing, 80%. This is dramatic. So just if we would shift our, our consumption to a, a more plant-based diet, this would be a, a really a major, uh, a major transition in terms of biodiversity conservation. And then this, this, this uh, image on the right, which is a really nice uh, visualization by R6 Studios. Um, if we consider the total biomass of all wild animals and the total biomass of all livestock, livestock weighs 15 times more than all wild mammals globally. And I think this shows that we, are, that we really need to change how we interact with the rest of the living world. So I have been talking about biological diversity and cultural diversity. I switched back and forth between the local scale and the global scale. So how are they related? So 25% of the global land surface is uh, indigenous, are indigenous people's lands. And 40% of terrestrial protected areas uh, and ecological intact landscapes uh, coincide with these indigenous people's lands. So what I want to say with this, so one thing is that uh, indigenous peoples are really stewards for global biodiversity. But it's not only about, so if we lose languages, we are not only use, losing um, words, but we lose worldviews, how people look around, how people view the living world. And we need this diversity of, of, of voices and ways of viewing the world rather than, than, than this juggernaut of global capitalism that is really driving 
uh, the loss of biodiversity and cultural diversity. So we really need uh, we need this this uh, different voices and these different uh, views. And there's this really nice paper by Diaz et al, which really goes into that in much more detail. So uh, to summarize, I know this slide's way too full, but um, so. My point is we need to switch constantly back and forth to the global scale and the local scale. We have to consider how do, um, how, how do different localities contribute to global biodiversity and how can we put our, all our efforts together at the global scale also to support uh, local communities, uh, island communities, indigenous communities to, to act in their role as, as, as stewards. Um, and of course, uh, we need to not only look at the local scale, but also in all these interactions between different localities and, and learn from, from these different um, yeah, ways of viewing the world and embracing these different, uh, these different uh, viewpoints. So this was really short if you want to learn more. So uh, um, this is my book. It's only in Dutch now. It's being translated into Italian. Hopefully it will be uh, published soon uh, in it Italian. Yeah. And, I'm writing a children's book about the same uh, topic as well. And uh, yeah, I would be happy to uh, take any questions or suggestions. This is my Twitter. You can also reach me by email. So uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to your uh, suggestions. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Sita. That was really uh, super interesting. And as I said, as I announced it, uh, super multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary. And uh, we have some time to qu for questions. Just in the meantime, uh, Vale, can you please open the, the third uh, poll? Uh, it's a much shorter one, but uh, we don't want to lose too much time. So please uh, send the third. Yes, thank you. So while we are discussing, we can uh, uh, people can enter the poll and uh, we can see the, we will see, soon see the final results. Uh, the last poll is uh, not a, a knowledge poll. It's just a, it's a, a basically opinion poll. Uh, so there's no correct answer, let's say. Well, at least I don't believe there's a correct answer, but just opinion. Um, so questions for Sitsa, please. You can uh, post in a chat. Uh, and then uh, somebody asked about the link to your book. Um, so uh, maybe you can post that yourself in the, in the chat, uh, Sitsa. They asked for the link to your book. Just uh, remember the book is in, uh, available only in the Dutch. But there is a summary in uh, in English, uh, and the links are also on the Eventbrite page. Uh, please, if you have any, so the discussion is really now open. We can talk about anything. Uh, so you can also ask Ken or Sitze or me, uh, or you can just uh, bring opinion. Um, so the floor is now open. We have about ten minutes. Um, but uh, let's start if you have a question for Sitze, something you saw in his presentation or uh, something that you uh, maybe, you know, that um, that you do research yourself and that matches what uh, Sitze mentioned, uh, that will be also very interesting to hear. Yeah, this is a connection between, uh, there's a, uh, Vale has a good question. So, you know, you, you look at these correlations, right? So that you, you just overlay variables and you correlate them, but what's the causality? I mean, how does it really work? How does it really work? How do you, uh, how does the uh, language diversity and preservation helps preserve biodiversity? Yeah, that's a, that's a really nice question. So, so I think, um, well, you can answer it at the, at the, um, at the, well, I was saying superficial level. Um, well, and it's not really superficial. So I mean, so one one thing what 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 the, what the what the data show is that that um, indigenous lands really cover forty percent of of these uh, of these natural areas. So that's really one really concrete um, concrete way to to also recognize that. Uh, these uh, people, um, uh, yeah, are are the um, are the stewards of the of these of these areas. So and and still in many cases, 
also uh, indigenous people are are still driven of their are being driven of their land sometimes even for conservation um, purposes so i think one thing is to 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 um yeah to acknowledge uh, that and also to shift uh, um, perspectives in this regard um and and yeah also well we have, there was this question in the poll about uh, the value of, of of global biodiversity. So it's also, yeah, we are also not valuing that in in uh, economic terms. So if people are, um, yeah, I mean, so uh, for example, um, yeah, now we had to, for example, if we think about Mauritius. But, but it, maybe if I may interrupt you, maybe there is a difference in a culture. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's really the key because the you know many Aboriginal cultures. They educate their children, you know, uh, to um, you know to be more to be more respectful, to be uh, to take care of their land. They're more like a driven uh, with the happiness, uh, you know, with the uh, happiness about how they um, collect harvest the land, how they what they grow, you know. And now yeah. happiness in the West is more, you know, more driven by uh, you know income by by uh, safety, yeah, know, well, by, by technology. Yeah, but I, I, I also think that's maybe a bit too simplistic because there are also, of course, many examples of, of, of also um, uh, indigenous uh, cultures that have driven species to extinction. So it's not necessarily that. It's not, it's not that, that, for example, one uh, part of the world is more, um, is, does everything better or that, I don't think it's maybe like that, but I, I think that we need to to reconsider like that there's one global narrative that we should all strive for, which is is perpetuous growth, economic growth at the cost of of everything. So and I, I think also in that regards, we can, of, of course, uh, learn from from different uh, uh, ways of, of viewing the world. And also, uh, yeah, that there's a point to say, well, this is enough. Uh, and 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 so of course, as you say, okay, how why don't we measure? Uh, why do we still rank countries based on their uh, gross domestic product and not on their uh, state of well-being? I mean, of course, efforts are being made mm -hmm. towards this goal. Yeah. Okay, and uh, tell me something. You mentioned this thing that uh, half of the agricultural land is the uh, basically livestock production. And, yeah. And it's like quite extensive, right? Mm -hmm. And, and so do you think no, that 80 percent, 80 percent of all agriculture are 77 percent of all agriculture? Yeah. Okay. yeah. And, but it's also very extensive, you know. And, yeah. But, so, but then in Netherlands, you have this very super intensive uh, production of livestock. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, but there are also <laughs> ecological problems in Netherlands. There's yeah. too much nitrogen released in soil, yeah. in but, water. But it's uh, first, wh where do where do we I mean, in the Netherlands, what do those cows eat? It's not, I mean, I think like Netherlands is like one of the largest importer of soy globally. Yeah. So, I mean, you cannot, that's why I, I say, well, we cannot only go for local solutions. We cannot only look within the, the boundaries of the Netherlands, but we have to consider also these, these global flows of, 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 of trade and, and- But what I'm trying to ask you, imagine now next 30 years up to 2050, do you think it's completely, Irrealistic to think that we can do this. Uh, we can still grow the livestock production, even intensive, uh, yeah. or we have to really go for the plant-based diet. You know, we just have to change the diet. It will be ten billion soon. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What, what do you think? Well, I think well, of course, we we are now only talking about um, you know just as inputs and outputs, but of course, the whole way we we treat living beings is is respectless, right? So it's it's not only it's not only about inputs and outputs, but it's also that animals are being grown to be killed constantly. In in a in they have a life cycle like intelligent animals. They have a life cycle of a few months to years. We we uh, we we we, uh, we impregnate uh, cows to give milk to humans. We kill the male. Uh, uh, we, we kill the male cows because they have no economic use. So this is really a complete 
I think, well, if, if you would design a society from scratch, this is not how you would do it. So, okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, 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 vale, we are close to the end. Can you please open the uh, poll results and uh, share the screen? I don't know. We can see. Uh, you can just share it to everyone. So uh, this is the the first one. Uh, so you see my screen. And uh, let's see what was the. Uh, so ma many of you are actually, um, let's say, a bit agnostic to biodiversity so marginally only so i think uh, more than uh, uh, 70 percent um let's see if you got the uh, biodiversity intactness index correct answer is canada so most of people most of people got it wrong um, then the second one is the highest biodiversity index is brazil that's the correct most of people got got it right um the last 50 years, uh, the human activities led to 60% decrease of uh, wildlife. Um, so most of the people got right, but some people also uh, clicked on 40%. Uh, the uh, case of global warming, 102 degrees, global sea level will rise. Uh, most of you got it wrong. It's a, a half meter. So it's not a, it's not a <laughs> huge growth, but it's half meter. Can I say something about this? Yes. I'm, I'm following this for about, uh, I think, 20 years. And each time uh, the values are uh, increased. So now they, the scientists are worried about the breaking up of a major glacier in Antarctica, which would again accelerate uh, even the, the prediction. So it's, it's, a fishy, uh, it's the state of the art knowledge at the moment. <laughs> Probably will be increasing over time. Okay, but I just took the one that's published paper and, uh, you know, the groups did the work and they say half meter. Um, then uh, the lowest uh, eustatic sea level last 100,000 uh, 100, years, it's uh, minus 120 meter. You saw it from uh, Ken's, I think, uh, presentation. That was the lowest in the last 100,000 years, about 120 meter. But uh, most of you got it wrong, so you put uh, minus 30. Uh, the average, the average uh, level of uh, C was uh, in average uh, minus uh, 60 something, but uh, the lowest point was minus 20, about minus 20. Uh, the fastest natural global uh, sea level rise recorded so far. Uh, Ken, you want to answer this one? You said four meter, I think, per century or something. Yes, it, that's right. Yeah. Four, yeah. four meter per century. So most of the people got it wrong. So when the ice sheet uh, started to melt, uh, just at the end of the ice yeah. age, a lot of water was released in the oceans. So you, so you, you know, in some places you see you're too pessimistic, and some places you see you're too optimistic. Um, loss of large animals uh, can lead to loss in biomass, uh, and there's a paper published that estimates about forty percent. So again, uh, most of you got it uh, wrong. Only 40% got it uh, right. So it's a 40% uh, loss in biomass. Um, humans are potentially threats for extinction of how many species by 2050? Uh, it's about 1 million. That's the, that's the estimate. But so here you got it wrong. So you, uh, although you're not biodiversity uh, people, you, you got it uh, right. And the last question, uh, what kind of diversity loss most rapidly? And um, you, most of you got it wrong. It's the linguistic diversity. And that's the work of Sitze. That's why he's doing his work because it is uh, uh, happening most rapidly. So it's the linguistic diversity is disappearing most rapidly. Uh, these are the first, uh, Vali, you wanted to say something? No, I just wanted to express my sadness when uh, talking about what we are losing, so. <laughs> okay, let's do the second poll. Uh, share it with me, please. And I will open also in the browser. Here's the second one. Uh, estimate the total number of islands uh, larger than uh, 10 square kilometer. It's about 6,000. So most of you got it wrong also. Uh, it looks like people put 25,000. It looks like, you know, um, yeah, you, you were thinking that it's a much bigger number, but it is only the one that are bigger than 10 square kilometers. So 10 pixels of one by one kilometer. 
Um, so which was one the, is the correct one? Sorry, what's the uh, the, right the six thousand? Six thousand is the so only five percent got it right. Um, what's the percentage of global biodiversity uh, across taxa? Uh, so the correct answer is uh, twenty percent, and uh, most of you looks like a, a reasonable number. One quarter you got it uh, right, uh, but it's not it's not five percent or ten percent. It's twenty percent. What's the percentage of all Percentage of all recorded extinctions in the past 500 years? Uh, Ken, answer. Was it the 70%, I think? I don't know. It's out yeah, of I think it's head. 70%. Yep. Actually, Sitsa put that. Sitsa, so, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, many people yeah, got it wrong. Depending on the source, uh, it's estimated between 60 and 75%, but it's of course important to note that these are recorded extinctions. And you okay. can, that can it also pointed out there, yeah, you might argue that it's also easier to uh, recognize Before, yeah. island species went extinct because you know, well, if we haven't found it here, well, then it's, then it's gone everywhere because it was endemic, so. Yeah. Okay, the mining, the mining area of the world, uh, it's about size of Croatia, so uh, three of you got it right. Um, so you, you, most of you, are over pessimistic. So it's not size of Germany; it's the size of Croatia. Um, then the highest per capita CO two emission bill. The highest bill should go to Australia. Uh, no, sorry, Canada. Canada, I'm wrong. Canada is the uh, the biggest CO two per capita emission. So Canada is the worst. Why is per this? Capita. Is, do you know why this is? Is this because of tar? Uh, you know, they use um, crude oil uh, tar for making. I, I will have to look at it, but uh, yeah, they also, I think they they drive large cars, inefficient cars. They mm -hmm. The country is, uh, you know, sparse and uh, they're big distances. So I think they have to commute and then they spend more fuel. Um, but also, they are producers of oil and things. Uh, from the below listed countries, the highest per capita biodiversity bill should probably given to uh, the answer is Australia. Australia, there's a paper published that they say that they, uh, they uh, are responsible for uh, relatively largest extinction and, and change in the uh, environment very quickly. And they're not a large uh, population. So there are, I think, 26 million or 30 million people. So it's Australia, when you look per capita. Uh, then country investing the most uh, in the megafauna conservation is Namibia. <laughs> so it's Namibia actually. So they lead, uh, they the, from these countries they lead. But Costa Rica is also good. So those of you that put Costa Rica, you, you're not so much off, but those of you that put, uh, uh, and this is only on the megafauna, so it's not, uh, conservation of everything, just megafauna. So there's a bit of uh, nuances also in the questions that you have to you have to read it. Uh, total estimated annual spending per capita could to cover the conservation uh, cost, help preserve biodiversity. Uh, so how much will it be? So there's no correct answer. This is a trick answer, trick question I put. Uh, there's no answer, so it's very interesting to see uh, that is distributed. Uh, Kind of equally, but uh, there's no correct answer. I don't know what's the cost. Somebody will have to calculate. I, I'm thinking it's more towards the bottom. It's towards the bottom. It's not. It's for sure not hundred euros per year. That's for sure. Whoever put that, uh, you are completely over uh, over optimistic. Um, then we have the country with highest percentage protected area per capita. Uh, it's Germany. The Germany has the highest percentage of officially protected area, but okay, level of protection also, that's another uh, discussion point, but they have the highest highest uh, percent. You would expect Canada, yeah, I, would, I was also thinking it's Canada, but turn out it's Germany. Number of trees European Commission has promised to plant, it's 3 billion. So it's 3 billion they promised by 2030. Well, they promised they have a, a big program, but uh, uh, very interesting. They would like to replant three billion 
uh, plants, uh, forest uh, plants uh, over Europe uh, till 2030, so in the next 20, 20 plus years. Um, so these are these questions. And now the last one is the opinion questions, please, Valer. Oh, I don't hear anything anymore. Now let okay. me uh, open in, uh, I open a browser. This is the opinion questions. So is uh, COVID pandemic and loss, biodiversity, loss of biodiversity, the habit construction correlated? Um, most of you believe it's a uh, yes. Increased interaction between humans and wildlife is the main reason behind this pandemic. In fact, there is a, a work published on that. Uh, Ken just sent me a paper. And so you got this thing, uh, I think uh, you are going in the right direction. So yes, it is uh, highly correlated, most likely. And I'm, I'm also glad that you believe in that. And nobody believes that the COVID-19 was uh, a leak from the Wuhan laboratory. <laughs> also nice to see. Um, then we have, how satisfied are you with nature conservation policies in the country region? Uh, most of you are unsatisfied, seriously disappointed. So I think we are going in a Greta Thunberg direction here, um, which is good, which is actually a good thing. Uh, the most important earth observation variables, in your opinion, uh, should be maps of natural habitat in darkness levels. So how much do we, how much do we uh, impact uh, natural areas? So that's more important that net primary productivity, but it comes as a second thing, also interesting. Can agriculture be combined with biodiversity restoration while being economically viable? We spoke about this a lot. Um, and you think that we have to re-innovate basically and some of you don't believe in it, but uh, most of people, 80%, I think you answered yes. So that's nice to see. Uh, what could be the best policy to reduce loss of biodiversity, loss of wildlife? Um, we offered some really extreme things, uh, total combat against polluters. Uh, looks like most of you agree in the international collaboration and conventions, uh, and that most of countries should accept the same way in European Union we now uh, deal with these problems. I think it could be scaled up to the whole world. Uh, current mainstream economy in the future, uh, we need a smooth transition to economization of our ecosystem functions. Very interesting. Most of you think that actually the, the system is, let's say, okay, but you just have to account for the, for the natural uh, services and uh, value of the uh, natural land uh, more, more objectively. And yes, last one. How much of your bruto income would you be willing to pay for biodiversity conservation through taxes? Uh, you are most of you are between five and fifteen percent. Um, so it's a good chance that that's something that is going to come. But uh, but it's nice to see that you are willing. Uh, only if only uh, six percent of you you are not willing to pay anything. Can uh, I so? Can I just say something? Because I just added a link uh, to a very interesting, uh, not yet published study. But um, if you want to conserve 44% of the whole uh, uh, world uh, nature, we need to pay uh, about 0.12% uh, of the global gross uh, domestic product, uh, which, is, uh, which seems pretty low. And um, the idea is that the uh, indigenous people who live in these forests in Amazonia, et cetera, that they are being paid, they get just an income to uh, uh, conserve their uh, uh, areas. It's a beautiful idea and, and people are really thinking about, uh, you know, how much will it cost? Is it operational? Uh, what do we need? Where do we need to conserve? So there are hopeful developments in this direction. So it's really- Can, can you see. one more time, just, just repeat please, how much to conserve how much? 44%, which is uh, of the global uh, terrestrial uh, Planet, if I'm right, it's, yes. it's, it's, it's one of the studies of one of our postdocs uh, who also was involved, James Allen. And then uh, these other economists, they calculate how much would it cost to conserve this and uh, to, to pay people to conserve this region. And you don't want to build regions and to exclude people. You want to, as Sitz actually points out, you want the indigenous people to, to, to uh, take care of their own environment which uh, in the end uh, is uh, beneficial for a whole biosphere. 
and then it was point twelve percent of the gross global domestic project. That so, sounds like a very low number. You know, it sounds like it's yeah. really cheap. But For but us, it's okay. Yeah. That's only forty four percent. I mean, if you come to like eighty percent. Maybe maybe this number will uh, triple. And uh, which forty four percent? I mean, maybe you, you know, if you go for the low lying fruit. But let's yep. say if you go to small tricky areas where you have uh, conflict of interest and uh, or, or like really uh, highly populated areas like India or China, you know, maybe then the cost will be higher. But still, it's uh, nice to see. Thank you for sharing that paper. Yep. Uh, that's super super interesting. And with this thing, we we have to uh, we have to stop. Unfortunately, when we went a bit over time, but uh, one more time, super uh, big thanks to uh, Ken and Sitze. Uh, very interesting talks, and uh, we will uh, we will share the talks. They will be published. The video will be published. You can watch it. So anything you missed, you can come back and watch. Uh, and also, we will, we can share the results of the of the poll, so you can see also the we will share the correct answers. But for that, you need to subscribe to our newsletter. So just go to our website, OpenGeo Hub, or maybe Vali, you can send a link. Uh, just subscribe to a newsletter and we will publish the, in about two weeks, we'll send a newsletter with the results of the poll and also the link to the video. So you can again, watch the video and, and read about the results and see where the, where the things went. Interestingly, most of the people answer wrong or they have a, a bit a diverging opinion. Um, so yes, and with this one more time, thank you so much, uh, Sitze and uh, Ken, um, and good luck with your work. Uh, we stay in touch and uh, uh, yes, uh, very nice messages and there's some pessimism, there's optimism, there's optimism in pessimism. And it, it's again, it's going to be on us to do the change. The change is not, there's only the second law of thermodynamics, you know, that it's set, uh, but uh, the changes are us, so we have to be proactive and we have to uh, think about these things.